I'm very excited to be with you uh, here virtually tonight. Um, I actually just missed uh, being able to be there in person. I was in Toronto last week. Um, but And I'm kind of wondering how I managed to not come to one of these sessions over the years I lived in Toronto, because I, I was surprised to hear when you were saying there, Luke, that these have been running since 2015, and you're up into the 300s. That's really impressive. Um, yeah, part of the reason I'm super excited is because I, I think that um, tech stewardship has sort of a similar... Um, the roots of tech stewardship that we're going to be talking about tonight go back to about 2015, um, and it's a Canadian-born sort of initiative as well, too. So I'm excited to um, do a few things here in 10 to 15 minutes, um, basically introduce you to the concept of tech stewardship and um, share an invitation, both an invitation to you personally um, to engage in some of the, um, the tech stewardship resources that we have bubbling up, um, to think about um, opportunities to bring tech stewardship to your organization, and more broadly, to think about how um, tech stewardship uh, might, or how Civic Tech Toronto, um, how tech stewardship might be relevant to it in the future and explore some of those opportunities afterwards with anyone who's interested in staying on the line. Um, so that's kind of jumping to the end. And that's what I'm hoping to kind of set the stage for in 10 or 15 minutes. <clears throat> to start off, uh, I'll give you a little bit more of my own story and, and kind of dovetail that into the origins of tech stewardship. So my name is Mark Abbott. I'm a professional engineer. Uh, pronouns are he, him. I'm calling in from the traditional unceded territory of the Tekemloops, the Shishwemek people, otherwise known as um, uh, Kamloops in British Columbia. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, did my engineering undergraduate at the University of British Columbia. And um, like a lot of people went into engineering in hindsight without a lot of real understanding of what engineering was. It's like, oh, you're good at math and science and you like to build things. It's like, you should think about engineering. And I thought, oh, engineers, like those are people that build things, right? And so I had this, in hindsight, pretty vague understanding of what engineering was, but dove in full of enthusiasm. And then you're just kind of head down, passing the math exams and, you know, getting in all the assignments. And then I shot out of my engineering undergraduate degree directly into a first career in consulting engineering um, based in Vancouver and a pretty typical kind of engineering pathway, you know, doing kind of um, heavy industrial municipal engineering for almost 15 years. And for a lot of that, I had my head down too. It's just kind of like, you know, what's the next project, build the next thing. And things would come up that would kind of bother me day to day in the work. You know, it's like, well, you know, should we be bidding on this project or some, you know, other kind of questions around sort of best practices and things we were doing, but no one ever stopped. No one ever paused and, and talked about those things. So it was always just like next project, you know, the next thing that we kind of had our head down chasing. Um, and so it was about 10 years into that first career of 15 years that I wound up connecting with um, a professional chapter of Engineers Without Borders. And all of a sudden there was this community of people that were saying, you know, well, wait a minute, what's, you know, what's the world you want to see and how does your, how does your day job actually connect to that? And so from dipping a toe in with Engineers Without Borders um, as a volunteer, by the end of that sort of 14 year period, I was spending more time on the volunteer work with Engineers Without Borders than on the high paid cushy job at this consulting uh, leadership job, this consulting engineering firm. So a little over 10 years ago, switched paths, moved from Vancouver to Toronto and joined the executive team of Engineers Without Borders Canada and did that for about four years. Um, then back in around 2015, this idea started bubbling up of launching the Engineering Change Lab. And the sort of impetus there was that, you know, the world's changing really quickly and the engineering profession needs to sort of kind of evolve itself if it wants to live up to its uh, potential to kind of drive larger change. And what emerged over the years, so the Engineering Change Lab, we kind of created by convening a microcosm of engineering in Canada. So we had academia, industry, government, nonprofit associations. We launched with 40 leaders from 40 organizations sitting in a circle uh, in a conference room in Montreal in, in January of 2015. And the story kind of continues to unfold. We've had hundreds of leaders and hundreds of organizations kind of participate through the Engineering Change Lab, looking at how the world's changing, how engineering needs to change. What emerged after the first few years of that Engineering Change Lab work was kind of this realization that the strengths of engineering have become its weaknesses. Like, you know, and we're engineers, we're practical problem solvers, just like, give us your problem. We don't have time for all that philosophical crap about who we are and our place in the world. Just, just give me the problem you want solved which is a strength until you overdo it. And I think as a whole, engineering has kind of overdone that strength to the point that um, engineering when is actually a pretty unself-aware um, profession about the nature of engineering and its impacts. So 
in practice, you get this kind of like this sort of unspoken, well, the further you are away from designing a bridge in a dark room, somehow the less that it is real engineering. And then in the rhetoric, you often get, you know, well, what's engineering? It's a mindset. Engineers are problem solvers. But when you stop and interrogate that, you know, you could say that about pretty much any profession and any discipline, you know, has a, a mindset to solve a certain set of problems. What we realized was kind of unique about engineering was how little self-realization there was about the, the nature of the mindset and the nature of the problems we were being prepared to sort of solve as engineers. And so as we kind of came out of this engineering silo, we sort of had a, a rediscovery that in a basic sense, engineering is the process of creating technology. Okay, well, that's just trading one definition for another. If that's engineering, then what's technology? And if you look, we look to sort of the social scientists, scientists who study the nature of technology and its impacts on society. And there you get kind of deeper ways of understanding technology. Often in the general public or even in um, engineering circles, there's this, you know, technology has become a synonym for things that are new and often digital. But if you look at it in a more fundamental way, you can think of technology as the means by which humans adapt our environments to meet our needs and wants. So those needs can be, um, uh, or so the means can be physical technologies, digital, biological technologies, even social technologies, if you want to kind of extend it, like legal systems. Um, and the environments that we're adapting could be our natural environment, they, but they could be our social environment, our political or economic environment. So if you go to that kind of more basic sense of, you know, like Marshall McLuhan, the famous Canadian um, critical media studies um, thinker, you know, we shape our tools and our tools shape us. So we kind of came out of the engineering silo into this like larger conversation about how, you know, as a society, we're evolving our relationship with technology. And we emerged from the engineering silo at around the same time as like in 2015, when Cambridge Analytica and the first Facebook um, scandal was happening. And so that, in hindsight, is almost seems to be like a watershed moment. We talk about it um, almost an analogy to like in the 1960s was when society woke up to the nature of our relationship with nature and the environmental movement was born. And we think that now is kind of a similar sort of 1960s moment where society is beginning to wake up to the nature of our relationship with technology. So Facebook and Cambridge Analytica is one of those kind of like sort of seminal moments and the launch of generative AI, all of these things you see, especially since 2015, this really growing global dialogue around, you know, responsible technology, civic technology, public interest technology, um, humane technology, um, and it's continuing to kind of grow. We think it's just the early days. So when we emerged from sort of the, the engineering silo, we started situating sort of our efforts within this larger tech and society conversation. And we wound up generating this concept of tech stewardship and prototyping and piloting it and sort of realizing that it wasn't just engineering that needed tech stewardship. It's actually, um, essentially everybody needs to build their tech stewardship capacity. So um, for the last few years, we've been in the process of sort of after doing deep exploration and kind of then um, prototyping and developing tech stewardship. For the last couple of years, we've been in the mode of sort of scaling tech stewardship out into the world. And that's what I want to um, talk to you about tonight. As part of that, we moved from being based at Engineers Without Borders to being based at Mars Discovery District. So that's kind of the, the, the secretariat or the, or the home of tech stewardship right now, although it's kind of been designed and created and continues to be kind of co-owned as shared infrastructure for anyone who wants to leverage it. Um, that's me with my partner, Colette, and uh, my son, Felix, and my daughter, Stella, who just turned six. So she would be uh, probably very upset that the slide hasn't been updated, but I will do that um, shortly after this. Um, so over the years, we ran all sorts of dialogues with, with diverse groups, small groups, large groups, engineers, non-engineers. And one of the icebreakers we would often use is this question of what do you think is the default um, trajectory of humanity's relationship with technology? And I know from talking to Luke that this is more of a like a 10, 15 minute kind of pitch. If we had time, uh, it'd be fun to have this conversation with this group. Um, and what we normally get, you know, so basically what we're asking is, okay, if as a society, we continue to sort of shape our relationship with technology in a status quo um, kind of mode, are we headed for, you know, a Star Trek next generation? Like there's some bumps along the way, but ultimately technology is, you know, unlocking sort of our humanity and we're, we're you know, um, discovering the stars. So that kind of optimistic view of, of, of a tech future or are we, is our default to heading towards one of those more pessimistic Terminator, um, Wally, Matrix, or Black Mirror um, kind of futures? And 
we've run this dialogue hundreds of times. And if you have a large enough group, you almost always get the whole spectrum. And it's kind of interesting to say, well, you know, students tend to be a little more pessimistic and senior people tend to be a bit more optimistic. You see some interesting kind of trends, but we also see archetypes in the responses. On the pessimistic side, it's amazing how much there's almost always a movie or a story um, that kind of described every sort of failure mode of tech and society. And so we know like, you know, if, if, if our use of technology is one of the things that make us human. Storytelling, I would argue, is another you know um, thing that is sort of fundamental to being human. We know in our storytelling uh, how important it is to get our relationship with technology right, and how many ways that could go wrong. Um, you know, all of those different movies, like Black Mirror, for those of you who've seen it on Netflix, is a whole anthology of like near future failure modes of sort of, um, of of getting our relationship with technology wrong. And yet in certain settings, in engineering faculties, in innovation hubs, in a lot of corporate settings, high tech companies, there's this underlying kind of orthodoxy that more tech, more innovation is necessarily a good thing. But when we pause and think about it, if we wind up in one of these dystopian futures, we will have technologically innovated our way into it. Um, and so uh, on the optimistic side, you also start to see sort of archetypes of responses. It's like, well, in the long arc of human development has trended towards sort of like greater well-being and prosperity. And so why, why would we think that that, you know, would, you know, might look bad when you zoom in, but you look at the long arc, there's no reason to think that won't continue. And people will say, yeah, we're developing all these new powerful tools that could cause problems, but maybe those same technologies could actually be used to solve problems and, and kind of shape that future. So, you know, you hear some great arguments on the optimistic side. And of course, on the neutral side, there's a lot of people who are saying, well, it depends what happens next. And the point here isn't to come up with a definitive answer. And like, and most of our opinions, like we, we always frame it as it's how you're feeling right now. And people's opinions will change over time. If, if I'm in an optimistic room, I will tend to get pessimistic because I'm thinking, you know, hey, we're not worrying about this stuff. And if I'm in a pessimistic room, I, I personally will tend to go more optimistic. The point of this kind of, of starting with this, this dialogue is that we believe like from a tech stewardship point of view that we all have an internal pessimist and optimist and they both serve really useful functions. Our pessimist says, you know, tells us to slow down and be cautious and think about all the things that might go wrong, which is useful. Our optimist drives us forward and thinks about what could be, which is also useful. So this is a theme in tech stewardship is we need a, the both end. We need to channel our inner pessimist and optimist and bring the best of both as we chart our way forward. What this conversation also highlights is like, no matter how, where you are on this range, like even if you're wildly optimistic, it becomes clear that like this is a question that's too big to be left up to chance. So the next natural question we often ask is, if you could make one wish to help ensure technology is beneficial for all, what would it be and why? And again, we've run this dialogue hundreds of times and you start to see archetypes in the responses. Um, people will almost always talk about policy. Absolutely, we need guardrails to, to guide where, um, you know, uh, where technology is taking us. People will talk about public awareness. And we'll point to things like, you know, like the social dilemma on Netflix that the Center for Humane Tech did, for example, did a great job of bringing awareness to issues around technology. People will um, point to best practices and principles and declarations. And all of these things will undoubtedly be necessary. What we came to in our journey was this, this kind of realization that, yeah, we need policy, we need public awareness, but by the time the public's aware, by the time the policy is in place, the technology horse has long since left the barn. So if we really want to make sure we don't wind up in a black mirror future, we need to get upstream into the mental models and the beliefs and the behaviors of the people that are creating and shaping tech day to day. And so that's where the concept of tech stewardship was born. When we came out of our engineering silo back in 2015 and looked at all the great work that was happening, what we didn't find is essentially what we wound up creating is tech stewardship. It's like tech stewardship is a professional identity and orientation and a practice, which basically just means that we make time to actually um, get together, refine this and discuss how we can bend the arc of technology towards good in our day jobs or new initiatives. So one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be here is Civic Tech Toronto starting way back in 2015 as a space for people to come together and talk about these issues and, and, um, and find new paths forward. That's essentially what we would call the practice of tech stewardship. And ultimately who really cares what you're calling, calling it as long as that's starting to happen. Like again, in my first career as a consulting engineer, no one paused and talked about these things. And when I did try to bring it up, you feel alone. You don't have the language for it. And so 
the essence of tech stewardship is really trying to create spaces and, and, a, and a frame for people to have that conversation, to create tech that's more purposeful, responsible, inclusive, and regenerative. And critically, not to ignore the tensions that show up even within those um, you know, laudable outcomes. So classically, there's the tension in, in a for-profit setting between, well, I have to, you know, have to, um, um, you know, uh, uh, prioritize shareholders and then the client. And, and I care about all these bigger kind of outcomes. So that's a classic tension. But even in like, say, the nonprofit sector and the climate movement, there are tensions between a group that are like, hey, given the, the scale of the climate emergency, we have to move fast. We don't have time to debate. And on the other side of that same movement, there's people that are saying, whoa, wait a minute. If a small group of elites kind of make decisions on behalf of everyone, again, that's replicating broken power systems, and that's not okay. So the essence of tech stewardship is saying, like, both of those things are true. How do we um, navigate that tension in a more beneficial way? Um, so the three core commitments of tech stewardship are to advance understanding about the nature of technology and challenge dangerously limited um, narratives and stereotypes. You know, in engineering faculties and on the typical university, on one side of campus, as we're training people to create technology in engineering, computer science, Somewhere on the other side of campus, we're training a different group of students to think critically about the nature of technology and its impacts in philosophy of technology, science technology studies, critical media studies. Those groups almost never meet. And when they do, um, they have a different understanding of the nature of technology. There's people that know how to create it, and there's a separate group of people that are studying how to think critically about it. So first, we create sort of a solid foundation of, of understanding about the nature of technology and disabuse dangerously limited narrow uh, stereotypes like technology is neutral. In fact, um, technology is not neutral. Our values shape and are shaped by technology. So the second core commitment is to understand and deliberate values. What are my values? What are the dominant values of the communities I, I'm involved in? The engineering community, the government sector, you know, whichever communities that are relevant, what are those dominant values? And in what ways might I be inadvertently baking um, my values or the dominant values of my communities into the technologies that I'm helping um, create and scale. And then finally, um, where does the rubber hit the road? So how do we actually, what, how does this translate into my own day-to-day -day behaviors? How can I help bend the arc day to daily with small steps or large steps to help kind of um, navigate these value tensions around technology with more skill? And so a classic value tension we talk about because everyone can relate to it when it comes to technology is around you know our use of cell phones. We all, to some extent, value um, convenience and we value our privacy. And you know we might in, uh, different ones of us might kind of have different kind of weightings on those two things. But we also exist within systems, right? So the way that companies have been set up, the way the overall systems have been set up currently, will tend to, to lean us towards giving up our privacy. In, um, in return for convenience. And so I have perso personal kind of autonomy within that system, but it's within sort of overarching kind of um, larger systems that are encouraging me in a certain way. So tech stewardship is saying, okay, when we see these tensions, rather than going into sort of either or thinking, how do we get the best of convenience and privacy? Or in different settings, different tensions show up. So in smart cities, between openness and privacy. In power generation, there might be a tension between centralized and decentralized generation, in automation between efficient work and rewarding work, and so on. And so the essence of tech stewardship is really about getting better at noticing these tensions, naming them, reflecting on them, and finding ways to take action. And basically what we're doing is creating infrastructure for, be able to, for people to support each other to do this. And so um, we actually run, um, we have a practice program that helps people kind of build the skill and we run different sort of settings, like we have a, a weekly drop-in practice session that's basically around this question, like what are the tensions you're feeling right now? And then helping people name and reflect and find ways to take action. Um, in the practice program um, and in, in sort of our overall framing of tech stewardship, we sort of name a meta tension that tends to be relevant when it comes to technology. And it's drawn from the first um, Jurassic Park um, movie, which is, we were so busy wondering, can we do it? That we didn't stop to consider, should we do it? And what we find with technology, this is something called a polarity map that we introduce, which is, you know, um, which helps us understand sort of the tension that can tend to happen between can we do it and should we do it thinking. So what are all the great things about taking a can we do it mindset an action orientation that helps us utilize resources for a focused purpose that has deep benefit for our direct stakeholders. Great. That's like 
business practices, best, you know, best business practices or, you know, like user centered design. But what happens when we overdo, can we do it to the exclusion of thinking about, should we do it? We get a tendency to jump to action too quickly in a myopic fashion, unintended consequences, missed opportunities. But you can flip it around in certain settings, government, nonprofit, social sciences um, often have more of a should we do it culture that uh, values reflective orientation, cultivating systems, broad contributions for a wide range of stakeholders. Great. Until you overdo should we do it thinking to the exclusion of can we do it and you get a tendency to get lost in complexity, analysis, paralysis. So um, what tech stewardship and kind of polarity thinking is saying is when we get into a tug of war between can we do it and should we do it, whichever one wins, we tend to wind up with actually what both sides fear, which is, you know, failing to realize the promise of technology or, you know, getting everyone gets eaten by a dinosaur if you want a, a more colorful kind of approach. But when we can get the best of both, the both end, then we can actually find opportunities to bend that arc of technology towards good and have technology be beneficial for all. So almost done. I'm going to end with like the offer. After years of deep exploration and prototyping, um, and as we went to scale this out into the world, we said, okay, the first thing we need is, some, is something to help people activate their individual practice of tech stewardship. So we went from kind of deep dive and, you know, really kind of hands-on full workshops into what's the minimum activation energy to help an individual launch their practice of tech stewardship, to be able to sort of integrate seeing these value tensions and navigating the socio-ethical kind of questions around their work. And we got it down to 12-hour online self-paced practice program, um, which at the end I'm going to um, invite if you want to try it out. You can try it out for free. Since launching in January of last year, we've had, um, uh, I think we're over 7,500 people registering right now, lots of um, university students, but also lots of professionals from Canada and now increasingly global to uh, through a partnership we have with All Tech is Human and other sort of uh, international partners. So the summer running of the programs just launched. So if you do want to check it out, um, you know, you'll have an opportunity to dive right in. In the program, we kind of, you know, go through those three core commitments and ultimately we introduce the, those four behaviors of tech stewardship to seek purpose, take responsibility, expand inclusion, work to regenerate. And we kind of peel the onion and give, give participants sort of um, a way of thinking about the common tensions. So there's the can we do it, should we do it tension. But as you double click on, say, taking responsibility, it's like, well, who wouldn't want to take more responsibility? Well, if you have more of a can we do it mindset, you might think, well, okay, if I have a, the ability to make things better, it'd be irresponsible of me not to take action as quickly as possible, which is not wrong until you overdo it. And if you flip it around onto someone with more of a should we do it mindset, they might argue like, hey, if I'm going to unleash this powerful technology in the world, I better make sure I've thought of everything before I do anything, the precautionary principle, which is not wrong until you overdo it in a certain context. So we're, we're kind of making it easier to spot the tensions around um, you know, these different behaviors. And we collect through the program these amazing stories of, you know, a student in their capstone project to design an Arctic patrol vessel. Yeah, and, you know, and they're thinking about sort of, they're doing the tech stewardship practice program. They're thinking about seeking purpose. And it got them thinking about sort of secondary purposes and end of life purposes for the vessel. Or, you know, someone who was doing, thinking, doing the program and working at a machine learning uh, place that was doing stuff in healthcare. And they were realizing that their data sets didn't include uh, children. And what would that do as they were kind of using AI to work on um, MRI and CT scans? So you get this amazing flow of people in their actual day jobs or their studies, um, noticing the tensions around them and finding kind of productive ways forward. And as we all share our stories, we can actually get better at supporting each other um, to, to navigate those tensions in a better way. In the program, we actually share a bunch of um, like sample videos of real tech stewards um, sort of inspiring stories of people sharing their stories of how they're finding those opportunities in their day job. I think I'm probably over time, so I'll skip the video for now so that I don't take too much time. But um, uh, we can go into this a little bit more deeply afterwards for those of you who want to learn more. As I said, we run weekly drop-in practice sessions. There's actually one coming up tonight at 9 p.m. that I have to jump to after this. And it's actually a bit of a ritualized, like, you know, um, a chance to connect with another person and just share what's the tension you're feeling this week and kind of work through that. And we typically get 40 to 100 people joining um, those sessions each week. Um, there's a whole theory of change behind all this about how we're kind of getting the innovators and the early adopters within teams and organizations and communities to help tip so tech stewardship becomes the new normal. We're not all, you know, we have really strong muscles as a society to develop tech and relatively weak muscles to steward tech alongside it. So we're trying to figure out 
how do we kind of make tech stewardship the new normal in these different communities? And there's kind of a whole theory of change around sort of nested tipping points. If I can tip my team, if I can tip my org, if I can tip my sector, um, there's a way that it kind of all adds up to larger change. And again, this is a Canadian born initiative. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, 30 universities are offering tech stewardship to students. There's a growing number of companies and, um, and uh, nonprofit communities that are starting to introduce tech stewardship. Um, and we've just actually had this um, policy brief accepted with the United Nations on how tech stewardship can ask, act as a foundation for multi-stakeholder collaboration to enable science, technology, and innovation for the sustainable development goals. So there's a lot going on all of this. I've probably gone over in my time kind of sharing it, but if you want more, um, to, you know, I'm happy to follow up with anyone who's interested in hearing more. You can go to techstewardship.com or programs.techstewardship.com. 